Thank you all. We have a wonderful speaker to uh, finish off uh, today's pre afternoon presentations. Uh, and I want to introduce her as soon as I turn on the light here so I can see what I'm reading. There you go. Uh, Donica Markegaard traces her farming lineage to her grandmother in Montana, whose family were beef and dairy farmers. Together with her husband, Eric, Donica started Markegaard Family Grass-Fed in 2006 in response to the demand for local, sustainable, and hum humanely raised beef. As a rancher, mother, and advocate, her vision and passion for regenerative land stewardship goes far beyond the ranch. Policy, community organizing, and education have all been integral to her life work of creating an interconnected food system that serves both the people and the environment. Donica has organized and led permaculture trainings, carbon farming workshops, key line design intensives, courses on homesteading and regenerative ranching. She is also founder of Earth Action Mentor, a nonprofit organization specializing in agricultural advocacy and mentoring. The vision of her family's ranching business, Markegaard Family Grassfed, is to aid in large scale restoration of western rangeland through cattle grazing, which mimics patterns found in nature. Her ranch was the first in their home county to transition its cow-calf operation into 100% grass-fed. They provide the local community with a direct source of grass-fed beef, lamb, pasture-raised pork, and dairy. Since this transition, their business has forged partnerships with some of the largest land trust groups in California, private landowners, as well as regional open space parks. Markegaard Family Grass-Fed leases 8,000 acres of coastal rangeland from these various groups, and each ranch has a grazing plan and conservation management plan that they develop in conjunction with the landowners and with the Nat Natural Resource Conservation Service. These collaborative partnerships have been very successful. In the past six years, they have partnered in raising $875,000 in cost share grants and mitigation funds that have gone directly into land they lease in order to restore and protect the natural resources of California grasslands. We're honored and pleased to welcome Donega Markegaard. Thank you, and uh, it's such an honor to be here, and thank you to all of Cuvira's staff and board members uh, for asking me to come. I feel very honored. And also, uh, thank you to all of the Native peoples of this land that have stewarded this land. We uh, were able to walk up to the, the highest peak in this area, Sandia Peak, and uh, connect with the land and the chickadees and the deer and feel thankful for this beautiful land and also very humbled as uh, sea level dwellers <laughs> as we hiked up that mountain out of breath. So uh, our family is in the coastal hills of, of California, Northern California, San Mateo counties south of San Francisco as well as north of San, San Francisco in Sonoma County. And, uh, we do our part in creating a vibrant local uh, food system by stewarding the watersheds we manage um, through cattle grazing, by mimicking natural systems and uh, with regenerative agriculture practices. So we provide the community with locally born, raised, grass-fed beef, lamb, pasture pork, and, and dairy, and also for the wildlife that dwells both above and below the earth's surface. So uh, we believe in a f future of that interconnected food system, much as how Avery was describing the fifth wave that we are all riding of new agrarianism. And uh, ne uh, we will next year mark our 10th anniversary of uh, direct marketing grass-fed beef. And even though agriculture has largely been left out of the, the history of conservation, um, 
now is the time to bring agriculture and food, traditional foods and nutrient dense foods back into that conversation and not back into it, but at the forefront of that conversation. So uh, I want to uh, use this opportunity to show a short video of a, something that we've been working on with an uh, Italian documentary photographer who uh, is, has spent the last year with us uh, documenting and honoring the year of the family farm and in hopes that we can inspire others into action and uh, share this and spread the, the life and, and the beauty that comes with these practices. It's challenging. It's hard work. We work seven days a week and we are at the whim of the weather and of the grass. Where this mentality comes from, where this business model comes from, isn't through books, you know, it's real life being out in nature and, and replicating that Mother Nature knows how to do it right. My name's Donica Markegaard, and my husband Eric and I are the ranchers of Markegaard Family Grass Fed. We provide meat and milk to people throughout the Bay Area. Eric is a sixth generation cattle rancher, and uh, I come to ranching with a background of permaculture and wildlife tracking. The way we're running our business stems from the history of Donaga being in nature. Through raising our animals out on pasture, we're able to mimic and enhance these grasslands and the way we do this is we are simulating the herd effect by keeping our animals bunched together and moving them frequently, timing it with the growth of the forage. And we're also building a lot of fence. <laughs> now the fence is a way to mimic the predators that were once prolific in this area, whether it be grizzly bears or wolves, kept these herds close together and, and moving. Cattle are amazing at creating and bringing back that carbon cycle that once existed on this planet of a way to reuse waste and turn waste into food. The reason I'm in this business is that I love cattle and I raised them for over two years with love and compassion and I treat them as equals. We try to take care of our animals before we take care of ourselves. Um, I was raised that my dad would feed all his livestock before he had breakfast and that's kind of the model I have followed. For how it feels to kill an animal you've cared for and taken care of and known their mother and their father and it is very difficult but um, I do it because there needs to be more ranchers like us that, that love our animals and, and treat them with respect and um, give them the life that we do. So we have four kids and they are all integral to the ranching operation. My name is Chris. I'm four years old. I like chocolate. 
My name is Quill. I am five. My favorite treat is ice cream. My name is Larry, and I'm seven years old. I'm my favorite animal on the farm is a pig. I really like petting them, and they're really fun to play with. My name is Leah, and I am 12 years old. My favorite things to do on the ranch is hang out with my pig Cookie, ride horses, and milk cows in the morning. It's so important to us to raise our kids with that primary learning of being out on the land and learning how to grow your own food, how to raise livestock. I really want to raise them with those values of care for the earth so that when they find their passion in life and what they want to do, that they have a strong grounding in nature. I sure hope that uh, more, more families get back on the land and get their kids back on the land, start growing food, even if it's just for your own consumption. Uh, but have that connection to your, your life source, which is the land and the food that sustains you and that feeds your family. So I came to holistic management and ranching uh, through wildlife tracking and uh, nature observation. And uh, as you'll see in the slide that, that's coming up, uh, Larry Markegaard, my husband's father, uh, once managed vast coastal rangelands in California. And uh, he was the first one that came to the area uh, that would move his cattle through the pastures. There he is, right there in the, um, in the left-hand corner. And so, so much of that, um, that philosophy continues on uh, with our operation. And uh, when I first met Eric, uh, he was managing a neighboring uh, cattle ranch uh, at, at that time owned by musician Neil Young. And it was one of the largest ranches in, in the area. And there was a huge biodiversity of, of life on that ranch. And it was a huge turning point in my life. Um, my mentor here in the right-hand corner, Gilbert Walking Bull, uh, adopted me as his daughter at, at a young age. And he was raised away from missionary schools on a refugee camp in uh, Wambly, South Dakota. And he was raised by, by holy men. And he didn't even learn the English language until he was in his 20s. So he had a very pure upbringing, unbroken tradition. And he taught me his songs and his ceremonies and his ways. And so as part of the uh, Quivira theme, I want to bring his teachings here to this conference. And as I go through the, uh, this presentation, part of our holistic context is these seven sacred principles that are at the core of the Lakota tradition. And uh, nature connection and observation uh, wouldn't be possible without the first sacred principle, wowakwaka, or sacred silence, that inner quietness that grounds us. And uh, whether you're out on the rangeland as a rancher observing when to move the cattle or whether you're about to walk into a negotiating meeting to negotiate a long-term lease, that sacred silence is, uh, is key um, to both yourself and those around you. Um, and uh, this is sort of why I came to ranching. I, uh, my background is in wildlife tracking, and uh, for seven years I spent every summer in the Frank Church wilderness of Idaho uh, tracking packs of wolves. And 
uh, I observed that uh, predator-prey relationship and what that did on the meadow ecosystems. I was one of the ones that they would uh, drop off at first light on the, the um, trail of the alpha male, and I would trail that alpha um, for sometimes for miles uh, alone following those tracks until I found the pack. And I would watch uh, pups emerge from the den from the first time. And uh, at one particular summer, we were uh, tracking a pack that was coming into the, the fringes of the uh, agriculture land. And I, to this day, remember that feeling that came over me because when you're tracking an animal, you're connecting to that animal. It's a very ancient art, ancient science that uh, speaks very deeply to our humanness. And I remember a moment of uh, where I nearly collapsed to the ground and I found out later that that wolf had been shot that morning by a rancher. And uh, in the circles that I was in at that time, uh, ranchers were not uh, regarded very highly. And um, I ended up marrying one. <laughs> so uh, like I said, that was a big turning point. When I moved to California 13 years ago, I moved to a land that uh, had cattle removed, much of because of the misconceptions about, uh, about cattle. And the land had been uh, rested and the forage was oxidizing. And across the fence was uh, the ranch that my husband managed. And uh, you know, we was all a bunch of trackers and researchers that lived here at this field station. And guess where we were always going to find the wildlife? It was on the other side of the fence. <laughs> and we were the kind of group that got really excited about voles. I, you know, when we, when we saw a, a healthy population of voles, all of a sudden we got really excited because we knew there would be aerial predators and foxes and bobcats and a whole life system that was supported by these voles. And there was really low density of voles in the areas that the cattle had been removed. And it was amazing the vole trails you would find in uh, the ranch that uh, was managed with cattle and managed by my husband and before him, uh, his father. So uh, this all goes back to the carbon cycle, which we've been talking about for the last three days. And that's what really uh, solidified my commitment to this work is that uh, this holistically managed land can produce and bring back those, those water cycles and uh, store that carbon and really provide a blueprint for the future. And uh, the next sacred principle, wochanto uh, gnake, is compassion. And this one is compassion for those that are close to you. So your family and your loved ones, that if you don't have a strong, central, sacred fire in your home, and in yourself and a healthy body, then you can't go out and do the important work. And this is something also that uh, we need to continually remind ourselves of, is destroying the soil is destroying ourselves. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt said this just so simply. And grasslands are where we need to have as a top priority because of their ability to build soil and sequester carbon, which leads us to the third sacred principle, wawaunshila, which is a deep caring for all creation. So that feeling of when you go to your knees and you grab up the earth, the soil, and you smell it and you taste it, and you just have this, this reverence and this love for all of creation. Like, you know, I've been hearing the Browns talk about the dung beetles and the earthworms, and it's just this, you know, all of this excitement from the presenters in this room about creation is, is very inspiring. And, um, you know, what do we do with that? What do we do with that, that, that love and that deep caring for all of creation? And um, I also studied with uh, Chief Jake Swamp of the Mohawk Nation, who founded the Tree of Peace Society. And his vision was if all of the children across the world 
were just taught to give thanks for all of creation, starting from all of those little things down below the earth's surface to the grasses, to the trees, to the, to the birds, to the, tr uh, the sky, that we would have peace on earth if we just did that one simple thing and taught our children that one simple thing. So those first three principles lead to this next one is wo wa wo hie. What are we going to do with that deep compassion and that love for those people that are close to us and the love for all of our extended family, including all of our creation? Um, so many times I see people get caught in those uh, first, first few principles and then they're not sure what to do with it. Now all of a sudden you found out that the earth needs us and the soil needs us and what is it that you are going to do individually to take action for that and for us it's it's food it's nutrient dense food and it starts with our family being able to uh, feed our children raw milk and grass-fed beef and be able to afford it <laughs> um, and that leads to our work which is key uh, with to having that collaborative uh, conservation. And when we can judge our wealth and prosperity on the amount of soil regenerated, the cleanliness of water that leaves our ranches, and the health and happiness of our communities by sourcing food directly from the food shed, a new economy will emerge when we can uh, put that as our highest priority. It's a new era of agriculture if family farms and ranches are going to continue, and this collaborative conservation is paramount. So this uh, is one of, our, uh, one of our conservation partners, Place and Hope and Beauty. We'll go through the partners, and they're both private landowners, uh, land trusts, as well as uh, government agencies. And you can see here, uh, this uh, native perennial bunch grass on one side of the fence and on the other side of the fence is the uh, neighbors continually uh, grazing and you can see that that vigor in those native uh, deep-rooted uh, bunch grasses in this case uh, stipa pulchra and um, it's because of the commitment, and this is David Anderson, him and his wife Marie, David's a physician, and Marie uh, um, is a, a businesswoman and also on the board of TNC California. And, uh, you know, one thing I realized as I was putting together this presentation is that David embodies all of these seven sacred principles, and that's why he makes such an excellent conservation partner and the ideal landowner. And here he is just observing his land, the way the water moves, and being with uh, the cattle. And he tells us when to bring cattle on, and he tells us when to bring cattle off. And it's not, nothing you can learn from books. It's from that deep connection. He now you know, left his home in the city and has moved out to the ranch just so that he can immerse himself in all those patterns so that he can steward the land. Um, Sonoma Mountain Institute, uh, a, a similar, a seasonal lease that we have, and uh, these guys, uh, Nate Chisholm and Byron Palmer, were brought on to this research institute that works with Occidental Arts and Ecology up in Northern California. And um, they were managing their land with a lot of mechanized approaches, uh, mowing the grasslands, and then, you know, they had some resistance to uh, bringing cattle on, and uh, after, I think th last year was the first year that they did, and they have, you know, f had excellent results. And uh, this year, um, this last spring was our second uh, season there, and we brought about 120 yearlings onto uh, this, this ranch, and their weight gain was plotted um, over the course of the time that they were there and it was an average of 2.5 pounds a day of weight gain and uh, it's they did it a little bit differently this year you can see it's not real high stock density they were going more for for the weight gain but also for the grasses so we're always balancing the health of the land and also the health of our animals 
This is that same ranch. This is stockpiled forage in February of this year, and we saved 20% of our rangeland ungrazed for the event of a drought. So that's really what has kept us in business this, this year as we're in this extreme drought in California That and taking on uh, new ranch land. We've uh, nearly doubled our acreage this year and our production is the same. So uh, we're really hoping for those rains so that you know, we can sort of uh, start to justify some of the expenses we've been putting out to in these range lands. Um, this is Peninsula Open Space Trust, beautiful coastal terrace prairie, incredible uh, stand of native bunch grasses. And, but you can see in this next picture that it lacks that vigor that uh, uh, was in one of the previous slides of the ranch uh, that David Anderson owns. And this was our first season grazing this coastal terrace prairie. Um, prior to that, the landowners, you know, it was coastal terrace prairie. They didn't want cattle on there. Um, so we, you know, through a, a change in, in research and education, um, we brought some, you know, we brought cattle in, we developed fencing and water, and uh, we hope that that native prairie will, the vigor will come back. Because what you see when these plants have been ungrazed, in this case it was about 15 years since they had been grazed, these perennials, they, they grow and they grow, and then they die and they fold over. So you have this ring of bare soil and eventually those roots die back and uh, you have uh, less of, uh, of these uh, species that, that everybody wants. So we're, we also work really hard to also uh, bring in the holistic context of our conservation partners and our landowners. And it's a, it's a fine balance at times to be working towards our context and also um, trying to accomplish their goals in resource management. Uh, Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space um, District, it's a, a, a regional park, and again, this, this ranch had, ha when they bought it, they kicked the cattle off 17 years ago, and uh, just this year, they reintroduced cattle. So this is before we brought the cattle in, that's my daughter, and that's that same pasture, same daughter, brought the cattle in, trampled all that oxidizing uh, forage, and uh, you get beautiful, lush grasses coming back. And um, a lot of that, those, those uh, areas have been taken over by, by invasives, is what you see when ground is rested. Um, and th that same uh, regional park bought our home ranch. This is uh, Toto Ranch, it's about 1,000 acres. Um, right, you know, right on the coastal hills. And you can see here there's much more diversity in the grasses because there has not been a break uh, in when cattle, cattle have been on the land. So uh, when my husband first came to that ranch uh, over 25 years ago, it was under private ownership and uh, he started cross-fencing it and developing water, building stock ponds, and uh, it's, it's amazing in productivity, diversity. I can't tell you how many aerial predators we have. It is incredible. Golden eagles, peregrine falcons, kestrels. Uh, it's one of the best ranches for um, aerial predators. Uh, this is a new one for us, um, a new partner, uh, the Wildlands Conservancy. We were recently selected for their Jenner Headlands Preserve. It's a 5,600-acre ranch which, with approximately 1,400 acres of uh, grasslands uh, right at the mouth of the Russian River. Beautiful, productive land. And um, here is uh, the, the, first, the first group of cattle we brought in uh, just, just uh, over a month ago, October 1st. And uh, this, this is, uh, you can see in, maybe in the, in the far back somebody, that's, that's our ranch hand, uh, Sue, and she's walking the cattle up that mountainside. And uh, this, this next uh, sacred principle, uh, wobbly hecha, is that feeling of being fully alive. Like that feeling when you jump into a cold stream and you get out and you just feel that vigor and you just 
oh, he just feels so alive. And I remember that moment after Sue had, you know, climbed that mountain uh, with the you know, panoramic, beautiful views of the Pacific Ocean and, and with the, you know, with the cows and with the calves. And, you know, I just remember the look in her eyes saying, oh, I could do this for the rest of my life. Like, this is it, you know, is that aha moment. Like, oh, this is, this is what life is all about. So, Wobli Hetcha, being fully alive um, in what you do and in every, every part of your life. Um, so, this, uh, this is that same ranch, the Jenner Headlands Preserve, and uh, this plant, uh, uh, Stipa manicata, is uh, also a needle grass, but an invasive needle grass that you see up here in the upper left-hand corner. And uh, that, this ranch has an interesting story, and I, f I, I feel like this story has been told over and over, over again on the West, and um, and I think it will continue, unfortunately, and because it's uh, there was a rancher, very nice, knowledgeable rancher of the area, and uh, new landowners came in, and he wasn't willing to change the practices to. Uh, you know, set up hot wire fencing and to move the cattle. He had a system and it worked for him. He had been continually grazing the property for nearly 40 years and it worked for him. Um, the cattle were healthy and he never supplemented that ranch. He never supplemented, never fed hay. Um, and we came to the ranch and, and honestly, my husband and I were very worried because he, you know, had to lease all the way up until the end of September and we were told we needed to bring cattle in October 1st. And the only thing left on that ranch was this one invasive species of this one invasive peren perennial. That, um, and the cattle would not touch it. The, his cattle did not touch it ever. They never ate it. They never ate the seed heads. They never ate the, the green growth coming up. But they ate, grazed everything else down to a golf course. And so we were thinking, oh gosh, our cattle are gonna come here and just starve. What are we gonna do? So, um, but we did it and uh, we, you know, we negotiated a lot with the, um, with the landowners and we came to an agreement and we brought the first herd in and it wasn't much longer that we were bringing more cattle in because our cattle were thriving on this species. And uh, one of the rangers, uh, Dash, last week when I was up there, he was demonstrating that, uh, that wobbly hetch of, oh, I'm feeling so alive because, you know, he just had to walk me up on this hill and show me an area that our cattle are actually eating this grass that, you know, they've been trying to get the other cattle to eat for over five years. And, uh, you know, there you see the grass in the upper left and in the right, the cattle have eaten it and trampled it and uh, you know we we've only had to supplement with minerals just because there wasn't a lot in that forage because it had been so heavily grazed but uh, you know these landowners have been really great partners because they're setting up the fences they're on board with working with us with a grazing plan and they've invested a lot into the ranch um, and really care for for how how it's managed um, so And you do a lot of this. You do a lot of, you know, just standing around and talking and, uh, you know, relationship building. And uh, that's just part of it. That's just what you have to do. The, you know, the, even though it's a sad story that that rancher, I, I, I wish he would have been able to stay on that land because he knows that land the most and has the most connection with that land. And I, I wish that the next generation and his family would have, taken it on. Um, however, you know, the days of the lone cowboy on the range are, are no longer. I mean, sometimes Eric and I wish that we could just be that lone cowboy and lone cowgirl out on the range. It'd be so much nicer because, you know, grass and livestock, when you feed them and you water them, they, they respond, they grow, and, uh, you know, they're, they're great companions. And I, I can't say the same about people. <laughs> um, you know, you feed them and you water them, even your kids. I mean, geez. 
So uh, the Resource Conservation District and Natural Resource Conservation Service has, have been really key partners, especially when we're taking degraded rangelands that ha have had cattle removed, and as a result, all the infrastructure has uh, fallen into disrepair. Um, they've been instrumental in getting these ranches back into production, and there are a lot of ranches like that uh, throughout uh, the West that are just out of production. Cattle have been removed, and there's one excuse after another why they are not bringing agriculture back, and it just doesn't work anymore. And uh, it's been left a lot on the shoulders of the producer, on the shoulders of the ranchers to be creative, to figure out how to get that capital to get back on that land. And uh, it's, it's challenging, especially these last few years of drought. Uh, that one ranch with the big red barn, it was just, you know, it just needed $100,000 right up front just to be able to bring the herd in. And uh, we, you know, put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that place the first few months. And uh, the, the, the program that they were able to offer us was a work for rent. So we paid for about five years of lease on that ranch in the first three months. And that's not easy. That's not easy, especially when you're making an agrarian income. Um, and again, Natural Resource Conservation Service, RCD, just standing around looking, what are, you know, this was, this meeting was about water. You know, where, where are we going to get water <laughs> to water all these livestock? So, uh, and here's another uh, project that we're working on. We've done a lot of key line, key lining over the years, but we've always had to borrow an implement, but now we, we own an implement and haven't been able to use it because <laughs> the ground isn't wet enough, but uh, we hope that this year we'll be able to uh, use it more. And uh, it, largely because of this guy here who was at Quivira last year, he came from our ranch down to Quivira. Uh, Darren Doherty from Australia has uh, worked a lot with us to establish our key line uh, system and uh, ways of, of moving water through the ranch. And that's what the key line rip, ripping looks like. And then uh, the next season, what you see is the grass stays greener longer in those, uh, those furrows where the, um, the shanks went through. And then the next year, you kind of stagger it and, uh, and go from there. So the roots are able to extend deeper into the soil. You rapidly uh, build, build your soil over time. So, it, you know, we're using a lot of different water capturing uh, <laughs> techniques. Any, any idea what this is? That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, in certain areas, you can strategically bring your cattle in when the ground is moist, and you don't want to leave them in there too long, but they'll create these pockets. And this was... Uh, on a ranch that uh, right after that they got what like six inches in a matter of five six days which is a lot for that area and and all those uh, hoof prints all had little miniature ponds it's like the micro scale of, of of ponds and that grass you know the the roots were fed and the grass stayed greener longer uh, we also work with Tomcat Ranch and Point Blue Conservation, so they are neighbor ranchers of ours, and uh, they have an on-site ecologist, and so uh, they're working to bring some of their research and documentation onto some of the ranches that we lease, uh, because honestly, my wobbly hitch, uh, what drives me isn't spreadsheets and data and <laughs> all of that. I want to be ranching and I want to be with my kids out there. So it's really uh, good to acknowledge that uh, we can't do this alone. And uh, some of us don't want to be, you know, sitting and crunching numbers and collecting data and, and all of that. But it's important. It's very important. And we acknowledge that. And we open our ranch to a lot of research. Peter Donovan's been out to do a, uh, a soil carbon uh, site, a monitoring site on, on, on this ranch. So, um, and we also do uh, some raw dairy. And that's something that uh, has been a passion of mine since, since I started having kids. 
And uh, so this is, this is our parlor. We uh, transformed a, a stock trailer into a milking parlor. And you can see it, see it there. We just milk one, one cow at a time. Right now we're just milking uh, three jerseys. We get an uh, average of 10 gallons a day. And uh, we, from that, uh, it's you know, going for about $18 a gallon. So for a very small scale agriculture, you get a big return, not to mention all of the other benefits. So that's what our milking parlor looks like, our clean room. That's uh, our ranch hand Sue filtering the milk. Uh, that's the the ice bath, and you know this is it right here. Just being able to bring your kids right from breast milk right to raw milk, and there's the the chart right there that shows uh, the similarities from breast milk to uh, raw cow's milk compared to to pasteurized milk. It's it's a whole food. Uh, you can live off this stuff. It's it's incredible. I mean, my my husband had uh, had allergies, and then we uh, you know we brought the the milk cows on, and, and to be able to drink milk directly from your farm or ranch has cleared all of that up. Um, and it's 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 really the core of the nutrition for for our family. And uh, this 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 slide really gets me fired up because I championed a. Uh, an, a California Assembly bill uh, this last spring, and I called it my grandmother's bill, common sense practices that are now illegal, because there's my, there's my grandmother there, my great-grandparents homesteaded uh, in Charlotte, Montana, and this was my grandmother at 90, probably her last pilgrimage out to the homestead, and the way that they homesteaded was to sell raw milk off of the farm, and now it's illegal to do that. So. Um, we got the bill all of the way to uh, the uh, uh, Agriculture Assembly Committee, and uh, it was one of the most emotional times of my life because we had been working for several years and bringing through a consensus process with the regulators, with the California Department of Food and Ag, and bringing in all of the stakeholders and uh, at the, the last hour, we had over 100 family farmers and ranchers in that committee room in support of this bill. And uh, myself, as well as Professor Cindy Daly, uh, were testifying in support. And we had seven men in gray suits, all of the lobbyists from all of the big agribusinesses coming to oppose this bill. And it did not even get a vote. And they had come in the last hour, even th those lobbyists that when we had all those, those meetings at, at the Capitol, that uh, you know, to get their input, they came in and opposed it really hard. They were very threatened to the point where they brought in the FDA. <laughs> and the legislator I was working with said, never in the history of her uh, experience had a national regulator weighed in on a state bill. So uh, we've got a lot, a lot up against us right now. And um, I don't know if you've heard, there's uh, an action to uh, bring about a national food policy. And uh, it's, it's I, I'm sure, a, <laughs> a daunting task, but you know, there's, there's po potential there. But uh, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot of hope that it'll happen in my lifetime. <laughs> we also raise uh, pasture pigs. These are uh, Red Wattle Berkshire crosses. We raise Hampshires just more in our um, marginal grounds, brushy lands, not on our uh, coastal prairies. And we do uh, mixed species grazing. When the cattle herd is close to the barnyard, we'll um, bring the sheep in with them. And at first, they, they have a hard time mingling. You can see the, the sheep are on one side of the paddock and the cattle are on the other side. And uh, it takes them a little while to get used to each other, but um, that works, works really well. We run three strands of, of hot wire for the, the areas that the sheep are grazing in. We do ranch dinners. Uh, we work with a lot of chefs in the Bay Area. Uh, we do farmers markets. Uh, we do ranch days once a month, bring the people out on the ranch to see where their food's coming from. Get the kids out there, get them dirty. <laughs> And uh, we uh, have online sales. We don't ship, but uh, people can uh, pre-order, uh, prepay, and pick up at a central delivery location throughout the Bay Area. 
And uh, what, what is it that we are leaving for the next, the next generation, seven generations, into the future? And um, this sixth principle, Woa Yushki, the joy of a child, my four-year-old here that, that I'm holding really sums up this principle because, you know, after we've uh, gone out to the pasture and, and gathered the cattle and, and, and moved them, you know, she'll just look up at me with this blissful look and just say, Mommy, I want to be a rancher when I grow up. And it's this, you know, just this utter joy that, you know, the, that's just this pureness of, uh, of a child. And uh, we, we can all be, we can all learn a lesson there from, from my four-year-old. And I just want to end with this slide here and thank you all for being here and committing these last few days to, to join together and think of collaborative solutions for the future. And uh, this last principle, Wozani, is a connection of your mind, body, and spirit. And these Bushman trackers here uh, uh, emulate that. And uh, this, this is an image that I think is, is very fitting for Back to the Future because this is an Afrikaans tracker, Louis Liebenberg, that I've worked with. And him and a, a software engineer developed uh, something called Cyber Tracker, which is a, um, a, a, a palm connected to a GPS, and it's all icon based for illiterate trackers to gather data. And uh, in seven days, this group of Sam Bushman trackers gathered more data in that region than Western science had in seven years. <laughs> And uh, that is powerful. And it reminds me so much of these ranchers as well that you meet and they know their place. They have a deep connection to place. And if we can harness that and if science can work together with ranchers and harness that and, uh, and, and a lot of them even know how to read and write and use the internet. So, you know, we're, we're farther along. Uh, so feel free to contact us. And oh, that, that's my son as well. He demonstrates wozani all the time. He made his own bow and arrows. And if anyone uh, ever, you know, he, he loves, uh, you know, obsidian. He's obsessed with anything that he can flint nap and make an arrow of. <laughs> so if anybody has any rocks lying around, then I'll pay you to send them out to us. Um, and uh, so feel free, anybody, if you're ever in the Bay Area, look us up, come out and visit, contact us. We'd love to get this work out. And also these photographs, we want to put them to use somehow. And our next project is documenting the drought. So if anyone has any ideas with that, uh, please, please get in touch with me. So thank you.